going to give you the title of the message yet, but guess what? We do not confer with each other on praise and worship. Any guesses? Yeah, the faithful God. Not even joking. Ooh, how good is God? That's exciting. I get excited because it just means I heard from God. Or neither one of us were listening and it was a complete fluke. But that is not what happened, I can assure you. Um, I don't usually get right into it, but we're going to with our scripture. Our key text for this evening comes from Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7 through 9. And though I'm going to end up doing a bit of um, maybe refreshing from last week uh, so we can build on top of that tonight, um, I first want to get started right away in the reading of the scripture, though, because I want to share something from it uh, right off the bat before we do anything else tonight. And does that sound okay to us? I don't know. Like Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7 through 9. So this is out of the NIV. You're going to see it up on the screens for you as well. It says, The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you. This is written to the Israelites, okay? Because you were more numerous than other peoples. For you were the fewest of all peoples. Verse 8, But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors That he brought you out, what are those words, with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery. Hmm. Have any of you ever been brought out with a mighty hand of God? Yeah. Have any of you ever been redeemed out of the land of slavery? Yeah. From the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Coming out of Egypt, when we read that in Scripture, that can be synonymous with coming out of a life of sin, okay? Anybody ever been brought out from under the ruler and the headship of a life of sin in your life? Yeah, we can apply this to ourselves, right? Verse 9, listen to this. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. Now, at this time, the Israelites lived in a time and were surrounded by people and cultures that were infiltrated with gods, little g gods, okay? Like God's little g. Okay, little G gods. Gods weren't something unheard of in the least. Okay, but the writer of Deuteronomy here is doing an excellent job of differentiating here. Okay, and he does it in two ways. And he does it in two ways in just three words, actually, which is really cool. Okay, first is the use of the word the. Can you put verse 9 back up there for us, Rob, please? Okay. So when he says there, know therefore that the Lord your God is God, he is what? The. That word. So he's going to show us two things in three words. The first word is the. Okay. The use of the word the. He doesn't just refer to God as God. He refers to God as the God. Now, I don't know about you, but these are the things that stand out to me when I'm reading scripture. These are the things that excite me when I'm studying and message writing on a Wednesday. If you ever want to picture what Pastor Rose is doing on a Wednesday, it's me sitting in my recliner with my laptop on my lap, geeking out over silly little things like the word the popping out at me on my computer screen. Okay, this part wasn't even in my notes in all of the rest of what we're going to get to, which is what I had written first. Okay, and then as I'm rereading the scripture, okay, we're going to get to the rest in a little bit. But as I'm reading through the scripture again earlier this afternoon, then all of a sudden the word the before God just jumped out at me and I got all excited And I'm like, yes, God, that's who you are. You are the God. You are not 
a God, as in one of many. You are the God. Just as Pastor Bob did such a fine job of relaying to us on Sunday morning, right? Your son is not just one of the paths that lead to heaven. No. Acts chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Verse 12 says what? Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. There are not many paths that lead to heaven. There are not many gods that will get you there. When they call out to their gods, they are not talking about the same God that we are talking about, no matter what somebody has told you. Because Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9, calls him the God. And the God and all the other gods do not go by different names and mean the same God. He is the God. Amen? So God isn't just a God, little G God. It's really hard to make a G backwards. I have to think in my head, am I really making it backwards? Am I? Yeah, okay. As in, so-and-so believe in their God, and so-and-so believe in their God, and we believe in our God. No, no, no. God, Jehovah, he is the God. The only God. Someone say amen. amen. Yeah. Now, they, this may be what I call a no-brainer, right? But it's neat to see it written in Scripture this way because it could have easily been written without the word the. Even the word a could have been put there. And I didn't do this. I was going to, like, screenshot. I love the... Um, there's a website. There's even an app you can get. But there's a website called Bible Hub. And you can look up a scripture, and it'll show it to you in, like, every translation, like, all the way down the page, every single translation of that scripture. And I was just going to, like, screenshot, scroll to where you get, like, a whole page, and I was going to make Rob put it up on the screen for you. And I was going to highlight the word the. Like, it don't matter what translation you look it up in, it's the God, the God, the God, the God, the God. Didn't matter if it was NIV, ESV, New King James, King James Version, amplified it was the God like there was no other way to translate those words other than the God and I love that this is the word that was chosen he didn't say a God it's written other places like I am a jealous God God says that I am a jealous God the word a there right it's not that it is he is the God doesn't say he is a faithful God it says he is the God faithful God, right? And what I just said a moment ago is that the writer of Deuteronomy, which is Moses, by the way, if you don't know that, okay, he did an excellent job of differentiating, okay, here between the little g gods, all right, of the pagans and our God, the true God, and he does that in two ways in just three words, the first being the word the, God is the God, and the next word, which is the focus of the message this evening, which is also the focus of praise and worship tonight, which I didn't even know was going to happen, and it's super cool, so thank you. I don't know who picked out the songs. I don't know if it's Jeffrey or if it was Gloria or who it was, but that was awesome. Thank you for being in tune. Did anybody catch what we read there in verse 9, that word, faithful. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. Yes, faithful. Verse 9, know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. Oh, so he's not just the God, he's the faithful God. Well, praise be. That's some good stuff. That's something to like sink your teeth into. That's something to get a white knuckled grip on. He is the faithful God. 
you're going through something right now, get a grip on the fact that he is the faithful God. It don't look real good right now. That's okay. God is the faithful God. He's never failed. I think we sang that tonight. He's never failed. The hubs and I lived in Florida for two years, two and a half years, and we went to a church there, and one of the pastor's favorite things to say was, he ain't never failed anybody yet, and he ain't about to start with you. And I was like, oh, I like that. Guess what? He's not going to pick me to start going, yeah, my track record's been so pretty good so far, but this one, yeah, I just can't handle it. <laughs> no, not going to happen, Okay. We don't just serve a God, we serve the God. And we don't just serve the God, we serve, he is the faithful God. Now, you know I like to look up definitions. You know, we know what faithful means. But Merriam-Webster, I like to go and see what they have to say. Steadfast in affection and allegiance. Synonym. Loyal. Oh, that's nice. Hmm, faithful. Firm in adherence to a promise or in observance of duty. Wow. And this one, true to a standard. Ooh, he's raised up a standard. The power of his blood. True to a standard. God is faithful. And because he is faithful, we can trust him. Let's go back to last week. He keeps his word. He keeps his covenant. He is faithful. He is trustworthy. You know, people can recognize if you're trustworthy or not, and they don't even have to be very old. My little guy, Isaac, is nine. We're almost at the end of third grade now, but at the beginning of third grade, he learned one of those hard lessons. He comes home, and we're in the car, and he's telling me about his day, and he's all bummed out. And I'm like, little dude, what's going on? Why are you all bummed out? And so he tells me, well, he says, I held something in confidence with someone. He uses big words. Like, his vocabulary is like a higher level of speech than both Chris and I. I don't know where it came from. And he's, <laughs> it came from his gaga. <laughs> that was good. Um, didn't come from her. She lived in Florida at the time. Anyway. <laughs> so he says, I expected someone to hold something in confidence, and they didn't. And I'm like, oh, bud. That's like a hard lesson to learn. It's good that you learn it now at nine, but guess what? You're going to learn it over and over again from the time you're nine until, like, we die. We learn that lesson, and it's rough when it happens. Yes, I thought he was my friend, but really I'm finding out he's not very trustworthy. And I'm like, dude, the words, like, the vocab. Trustworthy, is that like a spelling word this week? <laughs> Probably a spelling word in fifth grade, right? But he says, I'm finding he's not very trustworthy. And I'm like, oh, his little heart. Like, don't you hate when their heart aches and when their heart hurts? But what did he learn? He held somebody to hold something in confidence, and then they betrayed his confidence, and he found that they weren't very trustworthy. Huh. Well, guess what? God is trustworthy. He is faithful, and because he is faithful, we can trust him, and he keeps his word, and he keeps his covenant, and he is faithful, and he is trustworthy. Remember last week, who do you trust in? In God we trust, and it's written on our money, and it's available to be written on our license plates, and we have to ask ourselves, is it written on our hearts? It needs to be, and we should be asking ourselves if it is, amen? And the people are told here in Deuteronomy 7, it's not because you were high in number that you escaped. It wasn't your size. It wasn't your military might. What did we read? Or what do we think about? It's not by might. It's not by, by power, but by the spirit of the living God. 
the intimidation of the prospect of having to go up against you wasn't what caused you to be released from the grasp of all of those that held you bound. No, it was me, God says. It was because I loved you and I kept my covenant with you. The oath that I swore to your ancestors. It's because I'm faithful, God's saying. He's the God, the only true and living God. Not the idols of the pagans, not the little G gods who were false and lifeless ones. And therefore not the proper objects of adoration, true both of then as it is of today. He's the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy as shown by fulfilling the promise made to their fathers in bringing them out of Egypt and was now being shown to them as they were camped right up on the borders. That's where they're at at this time. Deuteronomy chapter 7, Moses is writing the book of Deuteronomy toward the end of his life. And we all know, guess what? Moses didn't get to cross over the Jordan. Moses was punished for smiting the rock. Moses never got to see Canaan, right? He got to look over and see the lamb, but he never got to step foot on it. But they are camped right on the edge of the land, ready to cross the Jordan and head into the land of Canaan, Canaan, which was being given to them as their inheritance. Heading finally, how long did they wander? 40 years. You ever wander in circles? Hopefully not for 40 years. Heading finally into the promised land. The faithful God, true to his word and constant in performing all his promises, he keeps his covenant of love with them and keeps his commandments. Hallelujah. And this word from Deuteronomy on his faithfulness, guess what? It's not old and antiquated. It's not archaic and in need of being dusted off the pages of the Old Testament scrolls somewhere. This was and is real and relevant today as well. It might be Old Testament. It might just be the fourth book in the Bible, but guess what? It's just as real and relevant to us today as well. As sure and as stable as now and as on time and can be as an as applicable and encouraging as it was in the days that Moses wrote it just before his death because God is a God who changes not. And Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I don't know about you, but I could use some sure, and I could use some steady, and I could use some changes not, and I could use some has he not said and will he not do, like Numbers chapter 23, 19 says, amen? Amen. 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 Faithful, like most Hebrew words, has a picture in it. It means something that can be leaned on or something that can be built on. It is trustworthy because the one faithful is rigidly observant to their obligations. Now, are we already seeing that faithful, the faithfulness of man and the faithfulness of God are two completely different things? Yeah, because what are men's hearts? Fallible? faint-hearted, and fickle. But what is God's heart? God's heart is faithful and perfect and pure and holy. And he can be nothing but. So I don't want you to think, yeah, but somebody promised me faithful and it ran through my fingers like sand. And so now God says faithful and I go, <laughs> yeah, right. Because they can't even be equated to each other. Okay. Man's faithfulness, fallible, faint-hearted, and fickle because our hearts are that way. We do our best, we try, we promise, we have good intentions, we ask God to help us, but we're fallible. God, not so. 
It is trustworthy because the one who is faithful, God, is rigidly observant to his obligations. And this describes God perfectly. He regards himself as bound to a certain line of conduct. But not only that, it's because of his holiness. He can be no other way other than that. A faithful creator bound to take care of and supply the needs of those who he has made. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 19, what's it say? God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, right there it tells us now here we're bringing Old Testament into New Testament. And guess what? He's still the same. He hasn't changed. And Paul's talking to us here in 1 Corinthians saying, guess what? God's still the same. He's faithful. Not only is he faithful, he's called us. Not only has he called us, he's called us into fellowship. And he hasn't just called us into fellowship with each other. He's called us into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Faithful in calling us into fellowship and faithful in calling you, period. He cannot begin without completing. With God, there are no abandoned minds. There are no half-hewn stones in his quarries. What does Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 say? says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. He doesn't go, eh, not you. God's never failed anyone yet, but uh, then there was you. There are no half-hewn stones in his quarries. There are no abandoned mines. He doesn't get partway through a project and give up and go, well, this was too tedious. I got, I bit off more than I could chew. This one, whew, she's a handful. Or he. I was referring to myself. <laughs> Not Brad. <laughs> Debbie's pointing at the, her hubby there, so... It is not idols who can show their faithfulness. Yet so many look to them and put their trust in them. And I don't want us to just think back to the pagan worshipers of Moses' day, though, okay? And I don't want us to even only allow our minds to go and wander to other religions only as well. We think, oh, idols, yes, oh, those pagans. Oh, idols, yes, they set them up in the temple that was terrible. No, guess what? Idols. An idol is simply anything that we place in our lives above our God, the God, the faithful God. Anything that we value more than we value him. Anything that we spend time with more than we spend time with him that we honor more than we honor him, that we trust in more than we trust in him. Let's see what Psalm chapter 115 has to say about a type of idol and what kind of faithfulness can be found in it. Psalm chapter 115, we're going to read verse 1 through 8. You guys are doing good. All your eyes are still open. And we're like two-thirds of the way through. Psalm 115. Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory, because of your love and, what's that word? Faithfulness. Verse 2. Why do the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in heaven. He does what pleases him. Listen to this. What are their idols? Mm, but their idols are silver and gold. Oh, so that doesn't just refer to Moses' time. Hmm. That doesn't refer to just some kind of pagan religion. Idols. Ooh, silver and gold. Hmm. 
Verse 4, but their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. Listen to all of this, describing silver and gold. They have mouths, but cannot speak. Eyes, but cannot see. They have ears, but cannot hear. Picture an idol being set up. Noses, but cannot smell. They have hands, but cannot feel. Feet, but cannot walk. Nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Verse 8, those who make them will be like them. And so will all who, what? Trust in them. Wow. So what did I say there? An idol is simply anything that we place in our lives above our God, that we value more than him, that we spend time with more than them than him dumb idols dumb like can't speak can't hear can't see can't touch can't move can't walk can't minister dumb idols which have given their worshipers no promises cannot be thought of as faithful but yet what does it say there in verse 8 those who make them will be like them and so will all who trust in them Why would we trust in an idol that can't speak to us, give to us, minister to us? Why would we put our trust in that? But by the grand design of Jehovah, the God, the the faithful God, excuse me, entering into covenant with Israel, the Old Testament shows him to us as having bound himself to a certain line of action, right? And we see that he fulfilled that to perfection in every way. And because of that, then we follow it all the way through the scriptures from Genesis all the way through the Gospels to the coming of Messiah, just as he promised. And we see that he, in fact, is the God, don't we? And not only that, we see that he is the faithful God. And because of that, even if, I want you to think about these next statements, okay? We're, we're coming to a close, like quick. My gosh, it's early. I should keep talking. <laughs> but because of that, even if we had no other experiences of our own, Like, we just got dropped out of the sky. We have no experience with anything around us whatsoever, okay? But we've read Genesis through the Gospels, and we've seen all the promise. First mention of Christ in the Bible, Genesis 3.15 And we've read all the prophecies, and we've read through all the prophets, and we've seen it all come down. And then we've read that whole, or not read, that whole period of silence, because there was nothing to read for 450 years. Wow. Malachi to Matthew, nothing. God is silent. And then we read the Gospels, Matthew and Mark and Luke, and then John, let me tell you who he was. And we read all of that. And even if we knew nothing else, even if we had no other experiences of our own, even if we'd never heard a fellow human being ever give a testimony, even if we'd never heard a sermon preached ever anywhere, even if we'd never seen a miracle with our own eyes before, even if we'd never prayed a prayer and received an answer to that prayer, Even if we'd never had somebody else pray on our behalf and received an answer. Just that alone. Just reading of his promises and seeing them fulfilled in scripture. Just reading all the promises and seeing them and all the prophecies just about Christ. And seeing all of them fulfilled to perfection. Just reading through the Gospels and seeing the love of the Father poured out through the life and the death of the Son. Reading and seeing and witnessing would be all the evidence that we would ever need 
to know that he is the God and that he is the faithful God and that he can be trusted and that if never before, if that's you, and if never before in your whole entire life, that tonight would be a really good time to begin trusting him. It doesn't mean that life is perfect. It doesn't mean that life's went the way you've thought or that you've planned. It doesn't mean that there isn't a really big giant standing in front of you right now, screaming and defying and defiling the name of your God right in front of your face like Goliath did to Daniel and to the armies of Israel. It doesn't mean any of that. All of that can still be happening. But if you've read through the scriptures, and if you've seen and experienced the lives of others, and if you've seen the prophecies fulfilled, and if you've watched through the Gospels, the love of the Father be poured out through the life and the death of his Son, then you know that he is the God and that he is the faithful God. And if he did all of that for his creation, you are his creation and he did it for you. And so don't let the giant that's screaming in front of you or don't let the pain of the circumstances around you make you doubt in your mind or in your heart or in the deepest places of you. Make you doubt his faithfulness and especially his faithfulness towards you. Because scripture also tells us that he is no respecter of persons. If he's done it for one, he'll do it for all and you are not an exception. Amen. So if Mercy Music will come back up to the front. As always, our altars are open for prayer.